What are you thankful for? What do you think? This is a question. What are you thankful for? <laughs> Family. Friends. 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 Savior. Church. Church. The Lord's sacrifice. The Lord's sacrifice. Your, wife. Your wife. Ooh, smart man. <laughs> I hope that you are thinking about what you are thankful for. I know that Thanksgiving doesn't happen till Thursday, but don't put it off, okay? Uh, think about that. That's why this whole series is, is that I want us thinking about, because this, this is a kingdom of God thing, uh, this gratitude that God asks us to have in our hearts. We're, we're in a series we, we're calling The Table. We uh, started last week, and then uh, we'll wrap it up uh, next week. Um, but it's, it's an important symbol, the symbol of a table. A table is where all the really good stuff in, in life happens. It's, it's around the table that we connect with people and we, we share meals. There's something about breaking bread and having friends and family. And, and there's, just, there's just something almost sacramental about, about a table and the life that we, we live around it. And so last week we talked about uh, the banquet. We had the passage about God's banquet in the kingdom of heaven. And, and uh, we kind of asked the, the question, how full is your grateful tank? How full is your gratitude tank? You, you pay attention to the gas tank on your car, uh, and, and that's important, uh, especially if you don't want to have a long walk session. Uh, but, but the really important one is how full is your tank with gratitude? Uh, how, how full? How full? And the other thing we kind of talked about is don't let the urgent crowd out the important. Don't let the busyness and the urgent things that, that are on the schedule and that have alarms that go off and accountability built in. Don't let them push the really important things like relationships and family. And don't, there, there, There's a danger there that we get, well, there's a danger, honestly, that we substitute the desk for the table. The desk is where you work. The table is where life exists. Amen? Amen. And so uh, today I, I want to kind of take it a, another level. One of the, one of the things that... that ancient culture was, was a part of was this idea of kind of, you know, a celebration and party. The, the word they most often used was the word feast. Say feast. Feast, yeah. I, I, love, I love the idea of feast, the, the Thanksgiving feast, you know. It, it implies lots. And in a, in a land where people didn't have a lot, that, that occasionally they would really go at it was a great thing. What, what if instead of uh, having birthday parties, from now on we had birthday feasts? You know, that, wouldn't that be fun? You know, just lots of celebration with, with people. And, and so there's all these feasts and all these parties in, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And um, in fact, Jesus did his, his first miracle at a wedding feast, at a, at a party. Uh, Jesus was always going around and partying and celebrating and feasting with people. And he was always going over to people's houses for, for dinner. And, and in fact, he was doing the, the partying thing so much that they called him a drunkard. Which, which was basically somebody that just kind of went to the party, party everywhere. And so here, here's the, the deep, important uh, theological truth you need to get this morning. Jesus was a party animal. <laughs> He's a party animal, man. And, and I know for some of you, you're like, okay, party, and Jesus is like, I, I don't mean party in the debauchery kind of a sense of the word. That's not what I'm talking about. But I mean party in the celebration sense. I mean, celebration is one of those words that, that theologians use. We come to celebrate today, you know. But most of us talk like, hey, party, man, you know, and G Jesus was. And so here, here's the way I would say it. For those of you that think I just committed sacrilege, I would say this. He was a holy party animal, Amen. Say, holy party. holy party. Yeah, there's something about, in fact, this was actually built into the culture of, of Jews. It was a part of what they did. Did you know that for Jews there were seven major festivals every year? And, and then there were other minor ones, but there were seven major ones uh, that they did every single year. And when I say a major festival... I don't mean like we sometimes do, you know, birthdays. Okay, a couple of you come over after work and we'll eat cake real fast so that we can get to bed before work tomorrow, right? You know, that, that's, that kind of a thing. Th this was, I mean, the work stopped. Some of these were days long. Some of these were weeks long kind of a deal. And, and so they would do it. So let me just run down through these seven festivals because there's some important truth in them individually uh, that I don't have time to go into, but, but you'll see in the, in the 30,000 feet 
version. The, the first festival was the festival of unleavened bread. Uh, it, it was it commemorated the Exodus, that where God delivered them, you know, uh, from all of that. And then the second one was the festival of weeks. It was about Pentecost. And the third one was the festival of the tabernacle or booths, and it it commemorated their time in the desert when they they lived in, in, in tents, and 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 God provided water and all of that. And then there was the uh, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, which was uh, the end of the agricultural year. They celebrated the harvest. There was the Day of Atonement when they celebrated God's forgiveness. That seems like a pretty important one to celebrate, you know. There, there was Purim, which was uh, commemorated the actions of Queen Esther, who, who was the vessel that God used to deliver the people from death. And, and there was the, the celebration or the dedication of lights, or what we call Hanukkah, uh, which uh, was initiated uh, at the rededication of the, the second temple. So there were the, these seven kind of big things. Things, uh, that were a part of it. And here's the, here's the big overarching truth in all of that. Every feast was about expressing grat- gratefulness to God. Every feast was about expressing gratefulness to God for what he had done. Whether it delivered them out of Egypt or used Esther to get them out of Bedine or whether it had been uh, living in the, in the desert or all of those sorts of things, all of them were doing that. It was, it was a time of great thanksgiving, of giving thanks, of expressing gratitude in all kinds of ways. They, were, they did this so well. In fact, I did a little math, and I don't do very much math, and not publicly usually, okay? Because, like, I got two degrees in theology, nothing in science. But, but you take seven festivals and divide it by 52 weeks, and that comes out to a, just a little bit of uh, over every seven weeks they had a festival. So can you imagine this? What if Thanksgiving came every other month? Yeah. <laughs> Some of you who have to cook for this are like going, oh, um, no, 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 we're not doing that, you know, sort of thing. But, but that's basically the way they lived. Every other month there was some giant celebration where they kind of gave praise and thanksgiving to God for all the things that, that God had done for them. And they, they were just very, very mindful of what was going on. So you remember from last week, and I want you to get this again this week, gratefulness comes from mindfulness of God's blessing in our lives. Gratefulness comes from mindfulness, from having it in our mind, from paying attention to it, from it being in our consciousness of all of the great things that God has done for us, all of the blessings uh, that he has poured out for us. And so basically for the children of Israel, every other month there was some sort of celebration that said, remember, remember what God has done for you, don't forget. That's part of the reason we take the sacrament every month is I have an opportunity to say to remember, remember what Christ did for you. Remembering is a huge part of Christianity and of Judaism, of remembering all that God has done for us because we have a tendency to kind of forget, and to kind of let things get in the way and it kind of slides off. And so God built into their calendar every other month, remember, remember, remember what God had done. And there's another kind of side benefit I'm going to kind of get off for just a little bit, but I just want to point this out. The other part that's important in every other month having these big celebrations was the intergenerational connection, family, family, friends kind of thing that happened in that moment when everybody got together. You want to connect with a different generation? Holy party with them, man. Share a meal with them. There's something powerful that happens when you do that. And and for me, when I think about this, I think about a lot of Thanksgiving and Christmases when I was growing up. We lived in Grays Harbor, Aberdeen, Hoquim, and uh, my dad's sister and her husband, uh, when I was little, were the closest relatives, and they lived in Bremerton. So every Thanksgiving and Christmas when I was young, we would go to Bremerton uh, and get together with all the cousins and the other relatives of my dad would all come together. uh, and, And I just remember it as a great time of joy when all of the cousins, we, we got together. It was our summit, you know. We would get together and plot ways to make our, our parents' lives miserable. All the cousins, you know, kind of share new ideas, you know, and then you go home, have a good time. And so we got into trouble together. We did all kinds of stuff together. But it was great family time. And a part of these celebrations is the idea that we need to bring the generations together. We need to bring the family together. Sometimes I think a part of our problem with all the intergenerational kinds of things is that we never come together and do the same thing together. And something that's fun for all. Do you know what crosses every generation in terms of interest and enjoyment? Food! Exactly right! (laughs) We have some geniuses out there. Every generation likes food. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but you talk about an intergenerational connection, grandma cooking and teenager eating. Because grandma can cook, you know. 
And, and so I, I, I just I want you to get this, a feel of, of what's kind of happening with all of these celebrations, all of these holy parties. And so I, I'm persuaded that we don't celebrate what God has done and is doing nearly enough. I, I think we need to celebrate more. I think we need to have more times of coming together. And, and, and here's the downside of that. When we under-celebrate what God has done, it has a tendency to lead to ingratitude. It has a tendency to kind of forget and, and we, we get this kind of delusional thing that, that somehow that we're the ones that are making things happen because we aren't regularly pointing out that God is the one that's making it happen. And, and then when, when we begin to think that we're the ones in charge, some natural things begin to happen like fear because we know in our heart of hearts that if we're in charge, we're in trouble. Aren't you glad God's in charge, not you? Yeah. Nothing personal, but... And worry and all of those, those sorts of things. And so this is important to our spiritual life that we celebrate God in, in, in all of our life. And so there's lots of places in Scripture where God talks about this. But I want us to look at one of my favorites, which is Psalm 100. So if you have your Bibles, flip over there or on our app or, uh, you know, in your phone some way. And I'll put some of the Scripture up uh, as well. Uh, and I want us to, to say this uh, together a little bit uh, because it's just, it picks up... Uh, it draws a wonderful picture of what gratitude to God looks like when it's in a, done in a healthy kind of way, and there's some great instructions. Um, and so before I get started, though, I do want to say to you, uh, in, in Hebrew, in which this is written, uh, all of these instructions are in the imperative. You know what the imperative is? It's a command, yeah, do this. It's not optional. It's not buffet. I think I'll do a little of this, I'll do a little of that, that kind of thing. It is, it is God saying, this is my command. These are all uh, in the imperatives. And so I want, us, I want you to, to read this together as a congregation because there's really something powerful about this thing. It borders on supernatural. Uh, you, you'd do good if you would read this every morning before you started out your day. This would just be a great blessing to you. So let's read it. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are the, peop the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. And this is such a, a rich passage. There's so much in there. This would be a two-hour sermon if I got it all in there. So I'm going to kind of hit the highlights, but there's just some uh, rich and important things in there. So that first section, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs. That first word, shout, is really important because when we think about shout, we tend to associate it with somebody raising their their voice. And usually in a negative way, you know, they were yelling, they were shouting. But actually the Hebrew word is the same word that they would use for a war cry. So it's like when you're going to go down and take the invading army and you got them surrounded and it's like, charge! That's, that, that's what's going on. It's a positive sort of thing. It's shout loud so that everybody can hear it. It's, it's the words that used for, for shouts of triumph after you've won the victory in all of this. So, so I, if I'd really been doing this right, I would have made you all stand up and raise your hands and shout this whole thing. But... That was probably a bad idea, so we didn't do that. Um, and then uh, to all the earth, this is just really quickly, but this is a reminder to the Jewish people that God did not bless them for their own sake. God blessed them that they might bless all the nations of the earth, amen? And, and that is our time. We are always to bless all the nations of the earth. We're to be reaching out and loving people and bringing them in, into the kingdom, and that's the way it has always been. And then the word for worship, the Lord, we talked about this a little bit before, but the Hebrew word for worship uh, isn't just about the gathered worship that we do here on Sunday, but it, it's a word that's used for worship and for work and for service, because Hebrew saw all of those as the same thing. They were all connected. I'm going to cough. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't want to do that into the microphone. Um, they, they, so that when, when you are come here, certainly you are to worship. But when you go on Monday, you are still worshiping the Lord. It looks a little different. Don't stand up in your cubicle and start singing a hymn or something. That might draw a little attention. But, but you, are still, you are still worshiping the Lord. In fact, I read a theologian that said it, said it this way, this idea of worship, worship that it crosses across all of the lines. It said, it is to orient one's whole life and existence to the sovereign master, the king of the universe. Worship is to orient one's whole life and existence to a sovereign master, 
the king of the universe. That's how the Hebrews understand that. Worship the Lord with gladness. Everything you should be do should be done with gladness. Uh, and so they've given us some instructions here, and let me just kind of sum this up. Uh, Psalm 100 is a way to live in the world, not just in the moment. It's a way to live every day, wherever you go and all that you do. I, I'm, I'm pushing this pretty hard. Worship is not just what happens here. Worship should be what happens everywhere we go. We should live in a worshipful connection to God. And then it commands us to orient our lives around gratitude for God. That, that's a pretty good orientation for our lives. I don't know what your life is oriented around. Maybe it's oriented around money, or maybe it's oriented around your kids, or maybe it's oriented around whatever, your career, fill in the blank. None of those are bad things, but I'm telling you, if you orient your life around gratitude for God, all of the rest of those things will go much better you'll understand the role that's going on. It's a call to, to live a life of holy party, if you will, of celebration of what, what God has done. And, and so this, this is kind of what it, what it looks like in this song. And this idea of the joyful songs, that's a really good one. Because the picture it draws in the original is, is, is the idea of laughter. Sometimes we talk about joy as an inner thing. That's not what's being talked about here. This word actually means laugh out loud. It means uh, have fun, gladness, pleasure happiness, all of those sorts of things. It's holy party. What do you do at a party? You laugh. What kind of parties do you guys go to anyway? You know, you're all like, no, we don't laugh at our parties. So it's kind of a sort of thing, you know. We don't do that joyful sort of thing, you know. But th 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 that's what this is talking about. It is the idea that, th that there's a certain sense in which those of us who follow Jesus should be the most joyful people in the world. You know, we've read the end of the book. God wins, you know. Praise be to God. And so I, more joy in our lives. We need more joy in our lives. We need more singing and, and way too much fear and worry and dread. Amen. More of this. And then the next verse says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his and we are his people and the sheep of his pastures. And um, the, the word for know here. So just before we get started, what, what this is saying is that knowledge is why we come with joy. Let me back up just a little bit. Because we know stuff, we can be joyful. Because I've read the end of the book, I can be joyful. Because I know whatever's going on now, in the end, God is going to win. Does that make sense? So that's the kind of knowledge. And the word for know here isn't, isn't just the facts. It's the idea of really getting it, right? Of really grasping it, of embracing it, of, of understanding it. it. It's like when your spouse is trying to tell you something, and intellectually you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then something happens, and all of a sudden you go, oh, now I get it, you know? Am I the only one that's had that experience? You know, come on, guys, you know, be stick with me here. A, so, so that's what the knowledge is. Know that the Lord is God. Get this deep in your soul that, that, that he is God. Uh, and, and so um, what is it we are to know? I want to kind of run down through these. These are the, the rest of this kind of broken down for the Hebrews. The first thing they had to know is that Yahweh is God. That their God is God over all gods. In fact, their God is the only God. Yahweh is the Hebrew word uh, for God. Uh, one of the Hebrew words for God. The most common one there. Uh, Yahweh, and, and, and if I could put this in, I'd say this. God is large and in charge. Amen? He is, he's, no, no, deep in your soul that, that Yahweh is God. The second thing was though that Yahweh made us. That, that you are created by him. You are not an accident of nature. Despite what your teachers may have told you in school. I only kind of half laughed because they kind of said that to me. You know, the, 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 you, you are a unique creation. You are a custom work of art by the creator of the universe. Yahweh made us. And you, you, I don't know that people really grasp this. They don't get it. They, we have a tendency to think, well, I'm just, I'm, you know, and I don't know, and there's billions of people and all of that. I, um, I, listened, I was listening to NPR the other day, and the Lord gave me a great illustration out of this. It, says it was a scientist, uh, and he was talking about all the things they're learning through DNA and how we're created and all of that. And, and he was talking about how everybody is different, you know, all the different personality types, all the different learning styles, all the different blah, 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 you know, all the data and all the DNA. And in and he said at the kind of the end of it, the conclusion of it was having looked at all of this, they believe that in, of all the billions that people have exist today and have ever existed in the history of the world, there has not been one single duplicate. Every single person, every one of you are a unique custom design by God. 
That's good news. Yahweh made us. And then the next one is that we are, uh, that we are his people. This, this is what I talked about before. You be God's kin. You be God's kin. We're doing hillbilly. That, that you're a part of his family. You belong. You, you are the chosen ones. Uh, when, when God says, these are my people, he's talking about you. That's, that's good news. You're a part of what God is doing. And so uh, just say it in kind of a modern, modern way here. Uh, you belong here. You are one of us. We live in a world where people are longing for a place to belong. I want to say to you, if you can hear my voice this morning, and if you can hear it on the tape later on, you belong here. You are one of us. It's why we push on this family thing so much. Because family is all the diversity and all of the craziness and all of the weird uncles that are part of the family. You are, are one of us. And, and you may be saying, I don't even know if I believe in God. That's all right. You're part of our family. We want you to belong and be a part of us. We love you just like God loves you. Amen, people? Yes, you belong here. And then they said that, that we are the sheep of his pasture. And, and this is kind of an idiom in Hebrew, but it's the idea that God is our provider. The, the role of the shepherd was to protect and provide for the sheep. And, and so I, I want you to know this, that God is your protector. God is the one that's watching out for you. And the good news is he's way better at it than you are. Thanks be to God. So let me wrap this whole thing up with this. You are who God says you are. You are who God says you are. Are. You are family, you belong, you are a part of us, you are of extraordinary value. And so questions about your identity begin and end with God. As a pastor, I see a lot of stuff. And I know that amongst our congregation, there are a lot of you who are like me. You don't need to build my ego up. You may need to whittle on it a little, okay? But there are some of you that really struggle with this. You, you really struggle with whether or not God really loves you. And, and you think, you know, if people really knew my past and my stuff, they wouldn't, you know, God knows all of your secrets and he loves you anyway. You, you struggle with identity and with worth. And I want you to say, I believe the people in this church love you. I know them pretty well. But even if none of them loves you, I am telling you, God loves you and values you. And your identity is nothing to do with what your grandma said or your grandpa said or your parents said or the teacher at school said or the kids on the playground said or that boy on the bus said. Your identity is 100%. It begins and ends with God. Wow, still have a little trouble with that. I'm going to say it one more time and say it big. Shout to the Lord, okay? Questions about your identity begin and end with God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so here's the instructions. Um, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And there's an interesting kind of thing going on in here. Um, the gates were uh, in, in the, the, the residence of a king. The gate was the most outer part of the wall, you know, and then there was the gate. So this is the beginning. There's a journey going on in here. And then the court was the innermost space where you would actually meet with the king or the royalty. And so what, what he's having is there's this kind of processional, this march going on where they're praising God. Remember Jericho? They would go around the, then they would, they would do these processionals and in ancient Hebrew um, they would do these processionals of praise and that sort of thing uh, to God and what he's talking about here is you begin with praise and you end with praise. Begin with thanksgiving and, and, and end with praise. If you've been to some more liturgical churches sometimes they have, uh, they begin the service with the, the priest coming down and he's got a cross and maybe they're sprinkling holy water on you and, and they've got the cat, you know, and all that. And I, that, That's what's being talked about here is that start a prayed for God. I think God deserves a parade. Don't you think God deserves a parade? And, and the, the moving towards what God wants to do. And then I love this next part of this where it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. In English, you understand that's the same word, thanks, right? Thanksgiving or thanks. But in the Hebrew, these are actually two different words that really color this picture uh, a little bit. And the words are toda and yada. Say, toda and yada. Yeah, so when you have your Thanksgiving meal, I want you to begin it by thanking God for toda and yada, okay? 
That'll confuse everybody. You'll get to talk about your church, okay? Um, toda is, is the word for, for the really party part of it, the emotional part of it. It carries the idea of celebration and fun and emotions and, and all of those sorts of things. You know, when you just go to a really good party and just really have a good time, that, that's toda, uh, just great celebration. Um, the, the other word, yada, give thanks to him, uh, is, is a word that actually has to do with the idea of, of, of throwing something. It's the idea of throw something out. It's the literal meaning. And sometimes there's an English idiom that comes to mind. You ever heard someone say, I'm just going to throw this out there? You know, they're going to, I'm just going to say something. And you, and you know they're going to say something that's awkward or <laughs> truthful or, you know, some, I'm just going to throw this out there. And that's literally what the, the word means to confess. It means to confess the greatness of give thanks to him and praise his name. Confess to him. Have a great celebration with lots of emotions, but make sure you confess that he is king of kings and lord of lords. Such a beautiful picture uh, of this. Because ultimately, God deserves the credit. Amen? It means give God the credit he deserves. How much credit does he deserve? All of it, yes. Uh, and so that's what, he, what he's talking about there. Then moves on. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. God is for you. We sing a song that says, God is for you. He is not against you. I love that song. That's what this is saying. His good, his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. To the generations before and the, the generations that come after. There's a, a definitely a Hebrew idea of the continuity of life that moves from generation to generation to generation. We are so individual oriented and so my life and my thing oriented. But, but they didn't think like that and, and God didn't think like that. The, the, the message here with this faithfulness continues to all generations and, and his love endures forever. Ever, is the idea that the God who was faithful to your great-grandparents was the same God that was faithful to your grandparents. It was the same God that was faithful to your parents. That is the same God that is faithful to you. That is the same God that will be faithful to your children. Praise God. The same God that will be faithful to your grandchildren and to your great-grandchildren in all of this. What a great God we serve. You, you are moving across the stage of life. And some of you have just got onto the stage. Some of us can see the end of the stage. But we're all just moving across, and, and you serve a God who is faithful, who will be faithful to your children when you are no longer there to protect them. As someone who is in the empty nest stage of life, that brings me great comfort to know that my God will be there for my daughter and for my son and for their families long after I am gone in the same way that God has been there for me. See why I love this verse. It is just, it's, it's so rich. He's the one that will be there no matter what. And so let me say it like this. We are grateful not because our lives are great, but because our God is great. I said this last week. I think I'm going to say it next week when we wrap this all up. We are grateful not because our lives are great, but because our God is great. We, we have this sense in our society that, that if you can't be grateful unless, you know, you have good stuff going on in your life, and that, that's not what's being talked about in this passage. In fact, these people had way worse lives than you. They lived in a desert when they wrote this. They, they lived in a tent. How many of you noticed that it was cold out this morning, right? How many of your houses were warm because the thermostat kicked on? Do you know they did not have thermostats when they wrote this? If you wanted to get warm, you had to go outside and start a fire. You know, and some of you, you got air conditioning. It gets a little bit warm and you kind of go and you touch it down a little bit and it gets cool. Ah, oh, you know, man, it was 85 degrees. We we're just dying. You know what they wrote this? You know what they did when it was 105 degrees? Sweat. That's what they did. That's what, you know, you, you all, if you get a little pain or a little ache, you go to get some little ibuprofen or a little acetamin and you take it in and you go, oh, I'm so, it's so difficult for me, you know. They didn't have any of that back then. They just suffered. They, they lived hard lives, and yet they said, our God is great. So I don't know what your circumstances are today, but I am telling you that we are grateful not because our lives are great, although we have pretty great lives, but because our God is great. And most of all, Jesus is the greatest gift of all. Amen. He is the one that gives us life. He said that he would give life and that more abundantly. It didn't mean like more life, like you're going to live forever kind of a thing. It meant that the quality of life. 
And, and for those of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, you know about this, that there is something about encountering the living God that changes everything and you are never the same again. And there's a level of life and experience that goes beyond expression. You can't really get it with words. And if you're, you're here this morning and you are not a follower of Christ, I am here to tell you God does not want something from you. He wants something for you. And what he wants to give you is eternal life. Real life, Zoe life, the life that, that makes us truly alive. That thing in your life that you think is missing, it's the life of Christ. Amen. You were meant for so much more, and he has that for you. And so really the, the story of the table and the story of all of this is the invitation to, to enter into life, enter into God's life with, with God's people. And so the way I've been thinking about it through this series is this. There is a place for you at our table there is a place for you at our table. There are lots of churches. This happens to be our church. There's lots of good churches. But I just want you to hear this morning, especially if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, there is a place for you at our table. We want you to be a part of it. One of the favorite stories in scriptures is a story that's sometimes called the prodigal son. It really should be the story of the loving father because the, the, the son is not the star. He's kind of the problem in all of this. And it's a story of the son that goes away, he de destroys the family, wrecks him financially, wrecks him in terms of the view of the community, embarrasses him, all of that, uh, goes away and lives a, a horrible life, and finally he gets to the bottom and he figures out he needs something better, and he figures out that, that the slaves in his father's house do way better than he's doing, and so he comes home and the father sees him coming home, and what the father's supposed to do is turn his back and shun him, and instead the father goes out through the doors and heads down and tackles him with a giant hug. And, and welcomes him back into the family. And, uh, you, you talk about the greatest Thanksgiving ever. I think that's the beginning of Thanksgiving in the Christian church. Because it says he went and he had a giant feast. He slaughtered the, the lamb that was being prepared. They got ready. They brought all the food. They, they was, it was the first Thanksgiving. And so I, I want to say to you, I don't know where you're at, but I want to talk especially this morning to those of you who maybe are not yet followers of Jesus, maybe you're just checking it out, you know, that kind of a thing. You, you are welcome. You are a part of us. We love you. Thank you so much for coming and be a part of us. But I want to tell you on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, there's a wonderful image that's a part of this. Jesus said, come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So there's this kind of this image of, of coming up for Thanksgiving. I don't know what it it's like you, but when I was in college, I would sometimes arrive right where Thanksgiving was going. I had to leave that morning, and, and my dad's like opening the door, going, come in, come in, you know. And when he opened the door and said, come in, the, the, the smell of, of, of turkey would hit you right in the face, right? All of a sudden, you go, hey, I'm hungry, <laughs> you know. And he, come on, come on in. And if, if you were late, he'd, he'd welcome you in. And I, I am telling you, Jesus is opening the door to you this morning to eternal life, and he's saying, come on in. Take a whiff of the smell. This kind of life is really good. And you, you kind of walk through the door. And he opens up the chair. The chair's there. There's a place for you here, son. Come and, and sit down. Take a load off. Rest. I know you're carrying all kinds of heavy burdens, but, but set them aside for right now. Sit down. Get a plate. Somebody bring a plate. Bring a plate. They get a plate. And it's a giant plate. It's a grandma plate, you know. And they get some, some turkey, and they pile the turkey on there. And then you got to put some stuffing on there, you know. And then, then you got to have some potatoes on there. And then, then the gravy, it's like, you know, like a, a gas station hose. It's like, shh. Start passing the food down. And that, that image comes from my, my years with my grandma. Basically, my grandma's philosophy of Thanksgiving was that if you could walk afterwards, you hadn't eaten enough yet, you know. <laughs> Jesus is holding a chair for you. What you long for, what you need for, what you know is missing in your life is intimate, personal relationship with the King of the universe. And on this Thanksgiving Sunday, the chair is open. If our musicians would come, we're going to sing a really great song about the table. Uh, about come to the table, and it kind of talks about all that stuff, all those objections you have. Man, if you knew me, you wouldn't want to be a part of me. God knows you, and he wants to be a part of you anyway. And besides that, I know most of the people's sins around here, and you're just in the middle of the pack. You're not that great. And besides that, he wants to forgive all of that. That's what happens when you come through. He forgives your past. 
He, he makes you a part of the family. You're saying, you know, I don't know this whole church thing, organized religion. I, I don't know about that. That's all right. We're not very organized at all around here. I'm in charge. It's kind of a disaster. This much I know. The chair's available, and he wants you to come, and he wants you to be a part. And so this morning, as we pray, we're going to worship in giving, and the ushers are going to come. And it's a great place if you're new. Put your connection card in. We'd love to follow up with you. An opportunity for, to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. But if the Lord is talking to you this morning, would you just ignore the ushers? I want you to hear a preacher just said, ignore the ushers taking the offering, okay? Because there's a much more important thing going on with your spiritual life in this moment. And you can pray right where you are and say, Lord, I want to come in. Let me, and, and he'll welcome you in. Forgive my past and he'll forgive it. It feels like a weight's been lifted off of you. Tell him that you want a relationship with him to come into you and be a part of you and and that you'll follow him the rest of the days of your life. Because once you get a taste of this life, you don't want to follow anything else but this life. It's in Christ. And you can know Christ this moment. This Thanksgiving can be your first Thanksgiving at God's table. And if you'd like, sometimes it helps to kind of make a bold stand. I'm going to stand down here kind of like the elders do. And if you'd like to come down, I would be happy to pray with you. If more come, if maybe some of the elders would come. Or you can just kneel at the altar and pray if you'd prefer to do that. But there's an empty chair at the table. It's got your name on it. Come. Come to the table this morning. Father God, I pray that you would hollow this moment, that eternal destinies would be changed, Father, and that new seats would come to your table and forgiveness would flow, Father. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.